OK, everybody. So welcome to this morning's session. Um, so Rod Gover will uh, continue with his uh, the third part of his series. Please. All right. Thank you very much. Um, hope everyone can hear me clearly. Let me know if not. OK, so um, last time, remember, we got to this um, slide with uh, Esha's picture um, of hyperbolic space. So that's the two-dimensional version. So there are the geodesics and so on and the boundaries at infinity, which is indicated by the fact that these fish, which are all meant to be of the same size, look like they're smaller in this sort of projection. Okay, so this is given mathematically over here. That's the usual dot product. And there's this conformal factor that blows up as you get to the boundary of the unit ball. And it makes the boundary at infinity, and it makes the geodesics you know, look like part circles like this, meeting the boundary at right angles and so on. Now, this gives a compactification of hyperbolic space just by dint of basically this embedding into Euclidean space. So the unit ball is the boundary at infinity. Um, and I guess you'll have the group. So we're in dimension D n plus 1. So you'd have the group um, SO uh, n1 acting conformally on the boundary and by isometries on the interior. OK, so this is a sort of model for conformal compactification that's um, sort of simpler to understand, um, for instance, than um, Penrose's original picture, in a sense, that I mentioned before. Um, let's rediscover that, um, that picture using kind of pure thought and, and, and tools that will be useful for us. So I'm going to move things around so I can see my own slide. Um, okay, so here's the conformal compactification of hyperbolic space, this time by what I call symmetry breaking. So remember we had that if we took, we were in dimension D plus two Minkowski space. So R D plus two equipped with the Minkowski metric. And we look at the forward null cone, then it's ray projectivization gives us the conformal sphere. So the usual conformal sphere that we talked about that before. So that's what happens. And then the group acting, I guess, would be um, SO D plus one comma one, right? That would, assuming we have a fixed vo um, volume form as well. So, so that would um, act conformally on the sphere. <clears throat> but what happens now if we break that group action, if you like, by um, picking a covector that just a constant space-like covector. So I've got this blue eye indicating that. Then we could form um, this linear polynomial by contracting it into the coordinates, you know, the position vector x. So that would give us this thing I'll call sigma, be a homogeneous um, function of, of weight, you know, degree one. Um, and so then, for instance, if I take that sigma tilde equals one, that will be a hyperplane, and I could intersect it with this null cone. Um, I could take it through the origin, um, so sigma tilde equals zero, and intersect it with, the with this null cone. Now, if I do the last thing, I will get um, obviously just a sub cone, so a one dimensional down version of this cone. This cone gave a conformal structure on the sphere. So in the projectivization, this, this one through the origin gives an SN inside SN plus one, um, which <clears throat> has a conformal structure. What's happening on this bit? Well, this is a, a, a hyperconic section giving a hyperbola, and actually it gets induced on it a, a um, hyperbolic metric. Now, you could either see that by computing directly, um, or you can even use our tools from before, because this is the flat model of conformal geometry. This I is a constant vector, therefore it'll be a parallel tractor. Therefore, by all of our talk before, this will induce an Einstein metric on this conformally flat structure. And because this thing has positive length, that Einstein metric will have negative um, scalar constant, so it has to be a hyperbolic metric. So what you're seeing is that this is getting a hyperbolic metric induced on the hemisphere, a conformal structure at infinity, and again, using our tools track to cover this from before, we know, for instance, that this actually has to be a conformal compactification of hyperbolic space. Okay, so... Um, now, there's a couple of comments. First of all, a trivial one. This doesn't quite look like that picture I had on the previous page um, of the um, Poincaré ball because now it's on the surface of this, of this sphere, this D plus one sphere, uh, or sorry, dimension D sphere. 
But if you take central, uh, sorry, stereographic projection from the North Pole and project this onto a hyperplane, then you get a picture from the previous page. Okay, so so this is the, uh, you know the same the same construction. It just you know requires that extra projection to get that. Um, so this is a better picture because it's in a compact space. The other thing is that these are now this is now the conformal sphere decomposed into orbits of the group. So. I, we had the group um, SOD plus one comma one, preserving um, the Minkowski metric. And now we also, if we fix this uh, co-vector, which is, we have this metric, then we're going to reduce down to um, SOD one, as I've got in blue, this group H. And so this is the H equals SOD one orbits on the sphere. This is an orbit decomposition of the sphere. So this, um, you know, the SOD1 acts transitively on the hyperbolic part here. It acts um, um, by isometries and it acts conformally on the boundary um, and it's giving the compactification. So this, this is going to be a sort of um, theme here where we look at smaller, bigger and smaller groups. I'll, I'll say more about that. Just before we do that, once again, um, a word from our sponsor, since this has got to do with relativity, how do we get the... Um, compactifications of Lorentzian signature things, will you just do the same thing with the flat model there? So remember the Lorentzian flat model was S1 cross N arising as a ray projectivization now with where you just use this slightly different bilinear form on uh, D plus two. Um, and then everything works as above. Um, if you take a, a co-vector constant, which will give a parallel tractor, um, then if this thing has negative length, then it splits this S1 cross N into two copies of compactified de sitter. Okay, so what the, the zero locus sort of snips this S1 into two intervals. And so that gives you the two copies of um, compactified de sitter. Um, you, it's easy to check using um, coordinates that you, you get, you know, the usual picture of de sitter. Um, if you if you do well, let's do the i squared equals plus one. If this if this covector you pick has length plus one, that corresponds to negative curvature. You get two copies of the anti sitter That then the the zero locus then splits this S n into two hemispheres. So that's so that's what happens. Um, so that gets your two anti sitters glued along their conformal infinities. And if you do i squared equals zero, you get two copies of, of um, conformally compactified Minkowski space. So these are all conformally compactified. Um, again, from the general theory, we know that's immediate. And in fact, if you do this with a, a null one like that, you exactly get this Einstein cylinder, but, but with its ends glued together, <laughs> right? So the Einstein cylinder was just the cutting a part of what you get from here. And it's literally on the nose. You really get the Einstein cylinder that way. Okay, so that, you know, to me, that's pretty amazing how simply that comes out. But those are just examples. Anyway, let's try and understand conceptually what's going on here. Um, in each example above, and I'm not talking about the previous page, but the page bef pages before now, um, we looked at the Poincaré ball and we've looked at stereographic compactification of Euclidean space. Okay, so... In both cases, there is a sort of big group and a small group. So both of them come from um, the conformal group on the sphere, which I'm going to call G. So G is going to be SOD plus 1, 1. We always take an identity connected component just to be safe. Um, <clears throat> so that's my G. The conformal sphere is G mod P, where P is a maximal parabolic in there. Okay, now the Poincare ball with its boundary, we just saw arose as two H orbits in there, where H is the subgroup SOD1 sitting inside SOD plus one one. Okay, so um, it was like an open orbit and a closed boundary of that. So that's how we, that's one way of understanding compactification of the Poincare ball. Stereographic projection arises similarly, you get um, Euclidean space as a, as a big open orbit on the sphere, um, and then the boundary is one point, and these are two Euclidean group orbits on the conformal sphere. Um, and this this time you would use a null um, a null vector to um, you know to break the symmetry. 
But in any case, once again, we get the smaller group H, Euclidean group sitting inside the conformal group, and up here, this SOD1 sitting inside the conformal group. So what you have is a larger homogeneous space G mod P. You then decompose it into orbits, um, and that's giving, um, you know, the, the if you have an open orbit, then basically that plus its 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 topological boundary in the in the homogeneous space G mod P is giving you the compactification of that open orbit, and the in the boundary is usually an orbit or or decomposes itself into orbits. All right, so that's by examples. And now, <clears throat> how do you curve this? So I'm working towards um, here the sort of very general idea of how to do compactification in the way, um, you know, to get a conceptual picture of how to compactify. So <clears throat> um, starting with homogeneous spaces is a way to, you know, and understanding the compactification the way I was just talking, there's a way to make curved versions. So this is built around the um, Cartan bundle and connection. So remember how that story goes. So first of all, for a Lie group G and a closed um, Lie subgroup P, you can get homogeneous spaces G mod P. And these are geometries in the sense of Klein. And then there's, if, if P is parabolic, for instance, then there's a canonical way of making a curved version. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that here. Um, so, and think of your model, so you have G mod P, your homogeneous model. G gives you a principal bundle over G mod P with fiber P, obviously. Um, so the idea of the Cartan geometry is you start off with your manifold, um, which think, think of it as being the same dimension as um, G mod P. Then if over that you have a principal bundle um, with the same fiber P, then you're in the starting setup, in a sense, for a Cartan bundle. Um, but this should also be equipped with a Cartan connection. Now, that's a thing which um, over here in the homogeneous picture, you have the more Cartan form on, on G. This is a, a Lee G valued one form on G. So a Cartan connection over in the curved picture on this curly G is also a Lee G valued one form, which gives a total parallelism, but it just has weaker equivariance properties than the more a Cartan form on G. So that's what a Cartan geometry is. Um, and that's the sort of basic setting for um, describing this general picture that I'll mention, but especially when, when P is parabolic and G is semi-simple. And then, um, in the latter category, for instance, a lot of our favorite geometries turn up like conformal geometry, projective differential geometry, um, hypersurface type CR geometry, and so on. And I've mentioned some of the groups that are involved. Okay, then tractor bundles. We've been talking about tractor bundles in the conformal setting explicitly. Um, in this Cartan picture, how do you get them to show up? Well, <clears throat> of course, if you have any representation of P, then you can get a vector bundle G cross P, you know, the associated vector bundle. But if this V is not just a representation of P, but it's a representation of the group G, um, thought of as a P module by restriction, then the Cartan connection on curly G gives you a linear connection on this associated bundle. And that's what we call a tractor bundle, a tractor connection, sorry, this linear connection. And, and in fact, you can go the other way, um, at least in this parabolic setting. Um, and, and, and some others. So, you could, you know, starting with the tractor bundle, you can recover the Cartan bundle and connection. But anyway, I don't want to talk about that so much as that, that these things are available in, in um, very general settings, you know, very widely available. Um, and then parallel tractors, so you have this bundle with a tractor connection, what does it mean to be parallel? Again, in the, in the conformal case, we saw that a parallel standard tractor had, had quite big impact. Well, generally, when you have parallel tractors, um, they lead, lead to curved analogs of orbit decompositions in a similar way. Okay, so I'm just going to sketch this quickly. We don't have time to do this very carefully, but um, here's the general theory about the curved version of orbit decompositions. So basically, you think if you have a model, so if you look at this picture, you have a, a, um, a group a Lie group G, P's are closely subgroups, so you have a homogeneous space G mod P, 
you then look at a subgroup, a least subgroup of G, and then this acts on that homogeneous space, um, you know, with orbits, of course. Now, if there's a finite number of orbits, often there'll be an infinite number, but if there are a finite number of um, sort of strata arising in this way, then you get in good shape to do one of these pictures. And these orbit decompositions um, basically arise from parallel tractors. So that's that's the connection with parallel tractors. So they give you what are called the holonomy reductions. So, so if you have, so, so imagine that homogeneous model, now take a Cartan geometry that's modeled on the homogeneous model G mod P, and suppose that it's equipped with what's called a Cartan holonomy reduction with holonomy group G, group H, the same H, right? Um, <clears throat> now, either you know what all that means or you don't. I'm not going to go carefully into saying what holonomy groups mean, but um, <clears throat> basically, um, you can think of H as the object <laughs> that at a point would preserve the parallel tractor that you might have around, something like that. So if you have this holonomy reduction, then the curve model decomposes um, into strata in, in, a, in a way in the sense of like we've been talking. So, so it, it, it decomposes into a disjoint union of, of parts that we're, I'm calling strata or curved orbits. And this locally has to look like the decomposition in the model. So in other words, there's diffeomorphisms that'll, um, local diffeomorphisms that'll map these strata over. And they'll, they'll have the same type of geometries um, on the different pieces. So if this red bit had a conformal structure on the model, then it will on the curved version and so on. Okay, so I can't say all that in absolute detail, but, but suffice to say, <laughs> um, when you have these models with, with finite number of orbits and so on, decompositions, and um, you have a Cartan geometry modeled on that, um, then a suitable thing called a holonomy reduction with the appropriate hol holonomy group will give you the same sort of decomposition. And these things come from parallel tractors in practice. So that's that's uh, um, well, the ones we want to look at. So, so it, it's a story about parallel tractors. So the compactification program I'm talking about here in general, but perhaps we should look at the picture again. Roughly the idea is that um, in the model, this um, open orbit, so that's an open orbit of H, so it has a geometry on it that corresponds to the group H. And um, this red thing is some sort of boundary, which think of it as the topological boundary in this homogeneous space. So that then gives a compactification of this open orbit. And the idea is you just match that up to a corresponding part in the curved version. So, so the, there's a um, part of the curved version, at least in general, which will have the same geometry type, and then by this general theory, the, the um, you know, if this was, say, a projective compactification or a conformal compactification, then this corresponding moving to the strata here will again be that sort of compactification in the curve model. So that's, that's really how you can set up a general program for compactification. So um, although I've got it written here, I perhaps won't just more or less read this out because it is just that idea. And then the only thing in part three is there's a sort of caveat that when you do this with orbit decompositions, um, often the geometries are more restricted. So we saw that in the conformal case, when we had a parallel standard tractor, we didn't gen get a general conformal compactification. We got, um, we got also an Einstein condition. So, so this is a sort of additional restriction on the geometry. So one may want to relax that. And, and part three here, is, is about how to relax those sort of conditions and, and, and get general theory up. And I'm only going to talk about that in the projective case coming up. Okay, so we now start the third lecture. <laughs> so this is where I'd hope to get to yesterday. Um, <clears throat> but so this is about projective compactification of space-times um, or geometries and applications of that. Um, so a warning now is saying the dimension four is D, which was N plus one. Now I'm mainly going to work in dimension N. This is just purely because my old slides had to mention N here, um, no, other, no deep reason. And here's some sort of background reading. Um, so this is a lot of work with Andy Chap, as you probably know, and also a result with my student, former student, Keegan Flood, who's now in Brno, having had COVID and um, probably is currently locked down. <laughs> uh, brave new world. 
Okay, so let's start um, here with uh, a projective compactification of hyperbolic space. So I gave you the picture of Escher before, which had geodesics as sort of part circles going out to meet the boundary at right angles. <clears throat> There's another way to embed hyperbolic space into a unit ball, um, which has um, instead the property that the geodesics, <clears throat> instead of being part circles, are still straight lines. So they're straight line segments now. <clears throat> so in a sense, um, the infinite straight lines of hyperbolic space are just reparametrized to fit in um, to Euclidean space. So indeed, this is a projective compactification, right? Because, because straight lines are being mapped to straight lines. Um, so it's just a reparametrizing of GD6. So there's a way to write the metric explicitly, which I'm not going to do right now, but I'll come to that later. Um, but one thing to notice that actually is that if you're a mathematician, well, first of all, the geodesics, um, you know, approach the boundary differently, but otherwise the situation is very similar. Um, in, the, in the conformal compactification, we had the group SO, um, N1 acting, you know, in this dimension, it would have been acting by isometries on the interior and acting conformally on the boundary. And actually that happens in this picture too. <laughs> so, so strangely enough, you have the same group acting on the interior, the same group acting on the boundary, but somehow it's a different compactification, you know, or, or is it the same secretly? You know, you might think oh, I can somehow change coordinates and it's the same. Um, well, no, you can't <laughs> so that, you know, you can prove that. So, so there's some sort of subtlety going on here. Now, so, so just as we rediscovered the, Poincaré ball, we now want to rediscover this Klein ball, what I would call the Klein ball. Okay, now sorry for my slightly low tech picture here. Um, but anyway, so this is <clears throat> so this is a different picture of SON1 orbits on the sphere. So once again, when we did the conformal case, we looked at SON1 orbits on the sphere. Well, we it was D1 then, but we've we've moved to N dimension. So um, and the orbits look different. <laughs> so, so this is because it's to do with projective compactification and it's to do with a different big group. Okay, so what I'm really starting with in black here, and I'm sorry, I haven't done the colors very well either, but we take Rn plus one, X are the standard coordinates or the position vector, if you like. G is the group SLN plus one. So this is just, we're supposing we've fixed the volume form um, and otherwise we have the sort of most general linear group that you could have there. So what are the orbits of SLN plus one on RN plus one? Well, it's pretty boring. I guess you have the origin, which is fixed, and then everything else is the other open orbit. <clears throat> okay, so in black here, there shouldn't really be anything drawn. <laughs> I accidentally drew these hyperboloids in there, but basically there shouldn't be anything. So now we ray projectivize RN plus one, but thinking of that group as acting, we get the sphere again. So now we're getting the sphere, not as a conformal sphere, but as a projective sphere. So it's the ray projectivization of Rn plus one. That's what I've written over here. You can think of it as the homogeneous space G mod P, where G is now SLN plus one and P is the maximal parabolic in there, right? So this, this black thing here is the sphere with SLN plus one acting. Now, what I want to do is reduce to the group SON1. Now, I claim with the standard way that SON1 fits inside SLN plus one that the orbits are going to look like what I have in red here. So in other words, there'll be an open orbit, um, a closed orbit, open, closed, open. And what's more, the, the, the polar cap up here, um, and you know, Poland's about here. So this polar cap is a copy of hyperbolic space. So it has a hyperbolic metric. Um, there's a hyperbolic metric down here. And this actually gets a De Sitter metric. <laughs> so how do you see that? Or well, you go back up and you look, in fact, at the in the orbits in Rn plus one. So we've now reduced to SON one. And so if you take this um, the metric that we're preserving, I'm thinking of SON one as the linear representation preserving that metric. Um, then from the metric you can, and with the coordinates you could form HXX, right? And I'm calling that tau. And so that the, the level sets of tower preserved under that group action. 
And so you get a hyperboloid of one sheet, you get a null cone, and you get the hyperboloids of two sheets. <clears throat> and induced on this one, for instance, for tau group one, you get a decider metric. Induced on here, you get hyperbolic metrics, and on the null cone, you get conformal structure. So this is a conformal structure separating hyperbolic space from decider, which is, I think, a very nice picture. Um, so this is once again a kind of symmetry reduction where the where the parallel object is now this metric H, right? So this is wasn't part of the original structure. Now it's part of the reduction. So again, we have a small group, which I'm calling H, which is SON1 here, and the big group SLN plus one. So it's a story of, of two groups or three. Okay, what about uh, compactifying affine space? And then we'll think about Minkowski. So <clears throat> affine space is easy to compactify projectively, and you probably know about this. What you do is you take your affine plane, here it is stretching off from, to infinity in all directions. You sit on it, instead of a medicine ball, you just sit, sit a hemisphere, so half your medicine ball, and you do central projection. So this is going from the center of the sphere down to the plane, and you identify the point it goes through on the hemisphere with the point it lands on on the, on the, on the affine plane, right? So this gives you a mapping of the affine plane into the open hemisphere, um, and then the boundary is the infinity. <clears throat> okay, so that's the affine picture. <clears throat> we can now make it a bit more ge geometric by instead of having the affine group act on this plane, we'll reduce to what's called the Poincare group, since you're, um, uh, you know, relativists, you know what that means. So, so, so the Poincaré group, so, so in other words, the um, subgroup of the affine group that's also preserving a um, Lorentzian signature metric. Um, so um, then surprisingly, well, the, 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 the compactification of Minkowski space is just the same because geodesics and Minkowski space are still straight lines. They're still affine geodesics, right? And so, so the projective compactification still works here and we get a nice projective compactification of Minkowski space. So what's different? Well, one thing that's different is, is how the group acts because when you get to the boundary, actually the boundary is a sphere of one dimension lower. That was true in the affine case, right? So it was just a um, projective sphere in the affine case. So I should have said that when I compactify affine space, the boundary is a projective sphere. But now when I make this the Poincaré group, it decomposes into an orbit decomposition that is actually just the one I was talking about, sorry, on the previous page. This thing doesn't go back sometimes. This, this orbit decomposition. So the boundary of our Minkowski space has this structure I was just talking about, right? So on the boundary of Minkowski space, I now have an open region which has um, hyperbolic metric, um, uh, an open region that has a decider metric, and a hyperbolic one here. And this is future infinity. This is the space-like infinity. Here's the past infinity. Um, and then the the n points of, of null geodesics um, is this conformal hypersurface in the boundary and the past end of them here. And then to do it in groups, well, it's easy to see what's happening here. The affine group sits inside SLN plus one as the isotropy group of a co-vector. Um, that's an easy little thing to do with linear algebra. And then to get the Poincaré group, it's slightly more subtle. Um, you should fix a contravariant um, uh, symmetric <laughs> metric type thing that's actually degenerate. It's Lorentzian, except that it has a zero in the bottom slot. So really this thing is supposed to be, um, you know, annihilate this thing that you fix, this co-vector. Okay, anyway, you can play around recovering that. So, all good fun. Okay, so... <clears throat> okay, so that's how rich the pictures can be even in the model, which I think is very interesting. So one would like to understand how to make curved versions of that um, and see all that flora and fauna arise, um, you know, in a, in a sort of tractory picture that's an analog of what we did in the conformal case, and that, that really works. Okay, so first of all, what is a projective structure most generally? Um, well, <clears throat> when you have an affine connection, nabla, here, um, psi and eta are vectors, vector fields. Um, <clears throat> if you change them by a one form like this, so this epsilon is a one form, um, then 
then these are called projectively related connections. Okay, so this sort of transformation. Now, this means that they have the same geodesics up to reparametrization, and that's if and only if. So, so this sort of changing of the connection um, preserves the geodesic structure up to reparametrization. Now, just in the box here is a shorthand for this sort of transformation. So I'm just going to write it as uh, nabla hat equals nabla plus epsilon, or cactus, as people who can't remember the name ups, for epsilon call it. Um, so um, yeah, so that's just a shorthand for that one form that's placed the role in here. Then a projective manifold means that you have an equivalence class of projectively related connections. So a manifold equipped with such an equivalence class, that's a projective manifold. So that's the curved version of, of what we had in the, in the projected case. Okay, so there's some motivation down here, but perhaps I'll skip over that. There's lots of reasons to study projective geometry. <laughs> okay, now just, um, you know, as we said in the conformal case, there was no distinguished connection. The tangent bundle, oh my God, it's happening again. We're in projective geometry. And once again, we have no distinguished connection in the tangent bundle. And once again, um, that's the bad news, but there's good news, there's a tractor connection. So we get a, a, an even simpler connection in this case, um, which has on a bundle of rank, just one greater than the tangent bundle, we have the tractor bundle. Um, again, there's a kind of position tractor, which, tells you how this filtration arises or extends the tangent bundle, if you like. Okay, so the X is important here. Okay, and then it has a connection on this um, tractor bundle and the connection is given by a formula. I've given the formula, the details don't matter. This P is now um, the projective scout intensor. If you work in what's called a scale to split this, then this is, is more or less the Ricci tensor. Okay, so this is the standard tractor connection. And once again, densities are involved. There's a slightly different convention to the conformal case, but um, I need that's, let's consider that a detail. Okay, here's an example. So now I talked to you um, very quickly as I'm doing all in this talk about uh, the general theory of holonomy reductions and so on. So, so let's see how it works in this case, right? So, so let me go back, uh, this never works. <clears throat> okay, so a projective manifold means you have an um, equivalence class of affine connections. That's what you have, torsion-free affine connections. And you just have an equivalence class. You don't even have one of those. So there's no metric around, and there's also no metric on the tractor bundle, right? So the tractor bundle, unlike the conformal case, in the projective case, has no metric. But you could say, what if we had one? right? You know, I'm going to have this projective tractor bundle, but I, I will suppose that the projective tractor bundle is equipped with, um, say, a metric, you know, so a, a um, symmetric bilinear, non-degenerate bilinear form um, that's, that is parallel for the, for the tractor connection, okay? Suppose that would happen. So that's what we're talking about here. So this is then a holonomy reduction that's coming from one of these parallel tractors. And so, you know, as I said, in general, this leads to some sort of stratification. So what happens in this case? Well, if you introduce a tractor a metric of signature P and parallel, um, then, well, if this has no signature, then you just get an Einstein manifold with positive scalar curvature. That's what it, what it means. Um, if, if the signature is non-trivial, then in general, M is stratified, stratified according to the strict sign of, um, now this is the tractor metric, H, the parallel thing, and you're feeding it <laughs> the X that's coming from the tractor, um, this clicking never works, sorry. You're feeding it this X, two copies of that X. So, um, so that gives tau, and then that, the, the, the strict sign of that stratifies your manifold. And then the zero locus turns out to have a conformal structure, and on each side, um, you get positive or negative um, Einstein metrics, and with the signature changes as you cross the zero locus. So this is an example that's just coming from the general holonomy type theory, holonomy reduction. So, so actually, I just wanted to say, and I forgot, that, that these, this conformal boundary and this sort of 
open um, part here that corresponds to an open orbit. This together is a projective compactification of that metric. So you have a metric over here that's say negative Einstein or something like that. And then this conformal um, thing here becomes the boundary at infinity for this projective structure. So it's like the model, like remember we had um, De Sitter and then the boundary um, to De Sitter had a conformal structure or we had hyperbolic and the boundary had a conformal structure and they, they were projective compactifications. Okay, so the curved version is the same. That's what this theorem is saying. Um, but what about more generally? So if you have a general projective structure, can we talk about compactification? And in particular, if you have a levy sevita connection, can you talk about projective compactification? So that would be good, right? Um, so, well, I'm talking about what you need. There was an earlier notion, which is by Eardley Science in 73, which is completely different to what we're doing here. Um, what we do here, and this is the theory developed with Andy Chapp, is produce a notion of projective compactification that is, in a sense, a true analog of conformal compactification. So we, we would claim it's the right analog for projective geometry of the notion of conformal compactification in the sense of, say, Penrose. <clears throat> okay, so remember for projectively related connections, I put um, nabla hat equals nabla plus um, the upsilon or the cactus, and that was a shorthand. So this is the same shorthand being used here, right? So, so this is the upsilon. And basically, we're going to say that if you have a, a manifold with boundary like this, and you have a, a, an affine connection on the interior of your manifold with boundary, then it's projectively compact of order alpha if there's a defining function for the boundary um, such that the connection that you get by this adding this particular one form, so D of the defining function over alpha times that function, um, <clears throat> then extends smoothly as an affine connection right up to the boundary, right? So here, um, well, this would mean that this Nabla connection does not connect, <laughs> go to the boundary because if this one does, this is singular, so that one doesn't, right? So um, in the way you think about it is once again, the boundary is um, perhaps at infinity um, for the geodesics and here. I'm going to say more about that. Okay, so this alpha here um, is, is just a real number at the moment. And what's it got to do with things? Well, this tells you about the rate of volume growth. So I won't go into the proof of that, although it's very easy. Um, but basically, if you take um, a volume form that goes to the boundary and then this type of projective transformation, you get a different volume form, which is the one corresponding, you know, the one preserved by Nabla. Um, then this is how they differ. So, so, so this alpha is telling you how fast the volume is growing for the um, for the for the original connection that you're compactifying <clears throat> as you go to the boundary. Okay, so here's some results to make it, you know, to try and get this to make sense um, in the same sense as conformal compactification. If alpha is less than equal to two, then the boundaries at infinity according to the geodesics. So that's perhaps a property that you want to think about. You know, you want when you're doing a compactification, um, perhaps that that the boundaries at infinity according to the geodesics for the connection on, that you're compactifying. Um, well, if alpha is less than equal to two, that's true. Um, and then a definition we will say metric is projectively compact of order alpha if it if and only if it's levy sevita connection and so it's just an obvious thing um right now here's one of the main theorems um because you know as as gr people or um different geometers we mostly want to have a metric around so what does what does projective compactification mean for metrics um well here's the result along those lines um, we have a restriction, a technical restriction on alpha, but I won't go into that. But if alpha is in zero two, so this is this range where the boundaries are infinity according to the now levy sevita connection it's going to be, and you have a metric on the interior, um, if you have a, can find a defining function such that when you form this thing, so we take the metric, we multiply it by rho to the power of two over alpha, and we subtract a constant times d rho squared over rho to the two alpha. 
Um, if this thing extends smoothly to the boundary, with the result being a metric for the boundary, you know, upon restriction to the boundary directions, then, then the metric is projectively compact of order alpha. Okay, so this gives a nice way of identifying projectively compact metrics um, by, you know, if you have this. And we have a converse, um, namely that if a metric G is projectively um, of compact of order alpha equals two, then we get the converse. So this becomes if and only if when it alpha equals two. Otherwise, we don't know that. Okay, but alpha equals two and alpha equals one turn out to be the really main things to think about, but I, I won't completely explain that. But, um, okay, so the idea of the proof in one way, uh, well, in both directions, really, you're using the Cazal formula for the levy sevita connection. Um, in one direction, um, it's pretty easy to show um, that if you have that formula for the metric or that relation, then the corresponding levy sevita connection is related to the original and the right way for it to be projectively compact, right? So it's really the other direction that's hard. If you know that the, that the metric is projectively compact, can you show that it, it's of that form at the boundary? Um, now, some features when alpha is two, um, this means this condition seven, which is actually this again here that I'm circling, is independent of the defining function. So you can change the defining function by multiplying by a positive function and you'll still get projective compactness. So that means that the boundary is actually equipped with a conformal structure, which fits with what we've seen in the model and in the um, case of the holonomy reduction. Um, if alpha is less than two, so remember we're looking at alpha in the range from zero to two at the moment. Um, so two, um, we get that conformal boundary. If alpha is less than two, we can get rid of the C and build it into the row. But when you do that, then, then, then row is determined up to order row squared. Um, so you actually get a metric on the boundary. Well, yeah, with this setting, you get a metric on the boundary. Um, some other comments when alpha equals one and C equals one, this sort of metric is appeared in the literature of Melrose scattering, and he called it a Euclidean scattering metric because they're ones that are good for scattering. Um, Alpha equals two is a lot in the scattering work of Farsi. Um, and basically, um, it, it's closely relinked to the ambient metric. So the ambient metric, the Fifthman gram ambient metric, for those of you who know about it, and I know Pavel, for instance, with um, Thomas Leisner and others, um, Ian Anderson have been producing explicit ambient metrics recently. So, so the ambient metric construction is actually a cone over a projective compactification. So when you produce those ambient metrics explicitly, you're also producing um, projectively compact things if you take this downstairs. Um, okay, the converse, I'm not, I don't have time, <laughs> you know, there's some comments on it here, but basically um, you're doing analysis with chef, careful choices of clever coordinates and so on, and again, using the Cazor formula. So um, let me move on to some other things. Um, so first of all, um, you get some strong asymptotics. So projective compactification, in a sense, is more rigid. When you have a metric around, it's more rigid than having a conformal compactification. So you get quite strong asymptotic properties straight away, namely, for example, um, you know, what this point two is saying basically is the metrics forced to be asymptotically Einstein, right? In the sense that, that the metric starts behaving like the Ricci tensor as you go near the boundary. The scalar curvature extends to the boundary. So that happened in the conformal case and that's happening again here. Um, um, I might comment on that. And then here's how the leading behavior of, um, of the uh, Riemann tensor is. Okay, and again, I'm gonna skip most of the proof. I will say perhaps something about the scalar curvature. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, because there's an interesting result that if you have a metric with scalar curvature bounded away from zero, and also that the projective structure extends um, to the boundary, right? So, so you, so suppose you have a metric on the interior of a manifold with boundary, 
Um, and it has the property that its scalar curvature is, is nowhere zero and it's bounded away from zero as you go to the boundary. Um, but and the projective structure extends, then the metric has to be projectively compact of order two. Right? So that, that's forced. And the scalar curvature, um, well, the scalar curvature extends to the boundary. Um, and because it's bounded away from zero, it'll be non zero there and so on. Okay, so, okay. Um, now, to explain how we prove some of those things, um, and, and in fact, to, to sort of shed light on the link between projective geometry and metric geometry, um, you can't really avoid talking about this result of Mikesh and Sindukov, um, which says what it means for a levy severed connection to be in the projective class, right? So, so let me phrase the question up here, when are the affine geodesics the geodesics of a metric, right? So, so what does it mean for there to be a levy severed connection in your projective class? And, and a, um, a sort of answer to this, um, in dimensions at least two, is this theorem of these guys. Um, so a torsion-free connection, um, so it's an affine connection, is projectively equivalent to a levy severed connection if and only if you have a non-degenerate solution, so this is a contravariant two tensor symmetric one, right? And it'll have a projective weight minus two, in fact, um, which solves this equation, right? So this, so you, you take the affine derivative of that contravariant tensor and take the trace-free part. So this is an overdetermined linear PDE, and it turns out it's projectively invariant. Okay, so. If you have a solution to that, <laughs> um, then there's a, um, so a non-degenerate solution, then, then there's a metric in your projective class. So this is sort of a weaker statement than just naming the metric. Okay, um, now this will play a role in projective compactification because the sigma is quite closely related to the metric that you end up getting on the inside. And in fact, the boundary when we do a projective compactification with the metric is going to be the degeneracy locus of this. So up here, we're saying it's non-degenerate, but you could allow it to perhaps under suitable circumstances to have a degeneracy locus. And that's, that's how the boundary arises. Okay. So there's a theorem of Eastwood and Matveyev, um, which that you can prolong this equation to get a tractor system, basically. So, so solutions of this equation are in one-to-one -one correspondence um, with solutions of the corresponding projectively invariant system. And this is basically um, almost, so this is a connection on, on um, you know, that's our thing that the, um, the metrizability equation is on. And then, this is a, um, a vector field with some weight, and this is a density. Um, and this is actually forming a, a certain tractor, a projective tractor. And that's the usual projective tractor connection. And here's some curvature modifications. This is the projective vial tensor and the projective cotton tensor. It doesn't matter what they are, really. These are some curvature terms. Um, so this is a connection on this, on this tractor type bundle. Um, and the thing is parallel if and only if you have a solution of this metrizability equation. Now, actually, if you want to recover this result of this, you, you can do it very quickly by just um, assuming that um, sigma satisfies the, their, um, the metrizability equation and applying the tractor connection, the usual tractor connection to this, and you just see the failure for it to be parallel and it produces those terms. So that's another way to recover their, their result. Um, and my student, for instance, has that written in his thesis. Um, Okay, um, solutions of this equation are then in the image of a certain BGG splitting operator. So this is using all the language now, um, the fancy language, but basically there's a differential operator that I'll call L um, that from sigma will produce a tractor of this type. And in particular, if you do have a solution, it has to be in the image of this operator L. But this operator L, and I'm giving the formula for the components here, um, this itself is just a projectively invariant linear operator. 
Okay. So we're, um, we're, we're basically but we're approaching time. So um, so maybe we should find a natural place to do. Okay. So we, uh, All right. Have yeah. some time for questions. I did start late, but I guess you've got a schedule. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah, well, anyway, analyzing that object so is, is what leads you to those results. So this L, so let's write it down here. So you take, take your solution of the metrizability equation, apply L, you get a, um, a symmetric tractor, a projective symmetric tractor. The determinant of this is the scalar curvature. And that, from that, it's easy to see that the scalar curvature extends to the boundary and so on. And then analyzing that thing and its inverse um, gets you this result on the order two compactification. Um, so just to say one other thing to finish on then. So we, we had the notion of um, conformal, almost pseudo Romanian <laughs> um, in, in the conformal part of the talks. Is there a projective analog of that? Um, and yes, there is, and that's what's in this work with flood, which I won't get time to talk about, but um, at least let me say what the setting is, that you take a projective manifold and a solution of this metrizability equation, but not just any solution, you require that when you form this L, this prolonged system, that that is either non-degenerate, which means the scalar curvature would be nowhere vanishing, um, so it's non-degenerate everywhere, or it's, it's exactly degenerate in the sense that it has co-rank one everywhere. And this corresponds to a nice case of zero scalar curvature. And with one and two, you then get similar results on the now degeneracy locus for this, um, for this zeta um, as, you know, as we got in these curved orbit decompositions for conformally compact and so on. So this is the sort of analog of that. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have these theorems that <laughs> mean that you get sort of nice decompositions that look like the model. And in particular, you get even, you know, that tricky model from the compactification of Minkowski space, you get a, a, a curved version of that, that all of the behavior arises. Yeah. So, um, and then answering a question from yesterday, yes, you, or the day before, perhaps you get an SL2 um, that corresponds to this projective setting and so on. Good, thanks. Thanks very much.